place to praise and worship an amazing God. Amen? So as we enter into this sanctuary where we come to this place, I have a question for you. What are you searching for? What are you? What are you? What of all? What are you searching for? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we've entered into this place and we've trusted in your will and your grace and your mercy. Lord, others may not know, but I see the significant indication of that. I'd agreed to do the message, but I didn't have the Psalter that the pastor read. I didn't have the sermon that, I mean, the, the prayer that Bernard did. I didn't have the list of songs that we started with, but Lord, they all tie in together. And it's about how amazing and awesome that you are, God. And so when we ask, what are you searching for? What should our response be? But let us just take a look at who we are and what we perhaps are substituting for you. Lord, I invite you to fill this place. Fill me, Lord. Use me to speak your words to your people. I pray that it helps to heal someone as you're using it to heal me. In Jesus' name, I most humbly pray. Amen. What are you searching for? Well, Cedar Grove, welcome to Sunday, August 12, 2018, the 19th Sunday of Ordinary Time. Some of you may not have known that we we're in Ordinary Time, but what that is. In the United Methodist Church's liturgical calendar, there are seven different seasons, Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, Pentecost, and Ordinary Time also known as Kingdom Tide. These religious periods do not occur on the same dates every year, but are determined by when Christmas and Easter are celebrated. The time between Pentecost and Advent is known as ordinary time and is used to reflect on spiritual growth. And so that's why you see green on the pyramids, because we're talking about growing. Ordinary time is also the longest season in the liturgical calendar. Perhaps because the season is so long and occurs for us during the warm months of our calendar year when we are involved with the end of the school year, summer break, beginning of a new school year, and other similar activities that are not necessarily tied to eventful worship like Pentecost and Advent and Christmas, there is the risk of becoming mundane and overlooked. But remember that this time is viewed on the liturgical calendar as a time of growth in the knowledge and love of God. No matter what time in the year, liturgical or not, we are a people, a society faced with pressure. We live in a day marked by pressure in almost every area of life. Now that the school year has begun, we have four and five year olds thrust into school where there is pressure to do well as well as every other child. There is the pressure of achieving a position on an athletic team, the pressure of the first day of college and living away from home, the pressure to get a new job, the pressure of finding the right mate, followed by perhaps marriage, the pressure of having children. How do we as individuals, as families, as a people determine the course of our lives? Priorities. Priorities. Now, everyone has a set of priorities, but are they well defined? Your priorities determine how you spend your time, with whom you spend your time, and how you make decisions. Priorities, godly priorities, are crucial. Have you ever asked the question, where is God? Why does God seem so far away? What is happening to my relationship with him? Have you ever found yourself asking questions of God? Of course you have. Anyone who is a Christian and claims not to have had such thoughts is perhaps less than honest. All of us at some time or other find ourselves in a dry and weary land 
where there is no water. Different people respond in different ways. Some give up and assume that God has simply abandoned them. Others feel guilty and assume that there is something deeply wrong with them that is preventing God reaching out to them. Some try to go on as if everything is normal. The last thing they want is other Christians to find out what they are, that they are not living the victorious Christian life. Psalm 63 that you heard were, uh, read earlier is a psalm of King David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. This is probably the occasion in 2 Samuel 15 when David's son Absalom conspired against him and David fled from Jerusalem. If we were to look at a map of this area from Jerusalem west lies the coastal plain. This is fertile valleys, beautiful lush orange groves and apricot pear and peach orchards. Just beyond Bethany, you begin to drop down into that great African rift to the area of the Dead Sea, 1,200 feet below sea level at its surface. That area from Jerusalem east gets very little rain, maybe about an inch a year, an inch a year. So it is quite a wilderness area. It is known as the Judean wilderness. David spent quite a lot of time in the Judean wilderness fleeing. Even though David is passing through a dry and weary land, his heart was not deserted, for he retained the vision of God he had received from the sanctuary. David realized that God was his God. There was a personal relationship with God that caused David to seek God. In searching this text, I found one writer that stated there are three types of souls, empty, dry, and satisfied. I want you to listen to see which soul. You are. The thirst of the empty soul is experienced by the unbeliever who has never accepted Christ. That individual tries to fill that emptiness with things like money or material things or sexual pleasure or power or entertainment or recreational pursuits. But there remains a gnawing, nagging emptiness in their soul that just won't go away. Augustine one of the early uh, theologians described the emptiness of the soul this way. Thou has made us for thyself. Talking about our relationship with God. She said, God has made us for God's self. And our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. So until we claim and look for and seek that relationship, there is that emptiness. The thirst of the dry soul experienced by the Christian who is either out of fellowship with God or has grown lukewarm in their relationship with the Lord. Every Christian experiences seasons of dryness in his or her spiritual life. It doesn't matter if you're a preacher, a Sunday school teacher, an elder, a deacon, a young Christian, an old Christian. All of us grow through times when it seems that our spiritual passion and enthusiasm and fruitfulness are all dry up. Ask yourself these questions. Have I been neglecting to study God's word and spend time in prayer? Have I been focusing too much time and attention on worldly things? Have I been engaging in a sinful habit and failed to repent? Have I nestled into a spiritual comfort zone and stopped making forward progress in my spiritual life? means that you become comfortable where you are. It's okay. And last, am I suffering from burnout? Have I failed to give my mind, body, and spirit the proper rest that God has commanded? So I want you to think on these questions. Think on them now, think on them later. To prepare yourself to move from being dry to something else. When we go through these seasons of dryness, it may be a clear warning sign that we are not where God would have us to be in our relationship with him. We thirst for God for a reason. It is our signal that we have wandered too far away from God, and we are called to look for ways to reconnect with our God. Our thirst is our soul's response to God's invitation to come back to God. Our thirst is our soul's way of calling out to God. Then there's the third type of soul, and this is the soul we want to move to be. 
It's called the satisfied soul. That's the soul response that you hear from David as he speaks. So when you heard the 63rd Psalm read, that was David's satisfied soul speaking. But we're going to go through it piece by piece. Now this does not mean that David is not experiencing his own trial. He is because he's in the wilderness. It does mean that David knows the source of his strength. He knows the source of living water and he acknowledges that in this psalm. Verse 1. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. David knew God in an intimate, personal way. David had spent time developing an intimate relationship with God. But David also wanted more. David recognized that only a deeper relationship with God could satisfy his soul. God was and is the ultimate reward. Our body and souls are thirsty for the Lord. We should seek him every day by spending time praying and reading the Bible. Verse 2, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. As King David has resided in his palace, able to look out and see the tent where the Ark of the Covenant dwells. He has seen the power and the glory of God in the sanctuary as he worshiped God there. But now he is in the wilderness seeking evidence of that same power and glory. For many of us, the deserted places of our lives are places we tend to avoid. These places can be scary and dangerous. There is no place to hide. But David recognizes that God has not deserted him. God has called David out of the comfort of his palace into the vulnerability of the wilderness. It is a place where there is only Time in the wilderness is where healing can happen. In the desert, there is only God. There is nothing but God. Like David, as we are drawn deeper and deeper into the heart of God, we recognize that the wilderness and desert places of our lives are sacred places. And we never thought about that. But those wilderness and desert places can be sacred places because those are the times when we are really going to be one-on-one -on -one with God if we seek God. Otherwise, we're going to be alone and lost. David has experienced God. And he remembers that experience. Verse 3. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. God's love is better than anything in life. Think of your favorite food. You probably want that food more than any other food. God is better for you than that food or anything else in life. God's love, love is better than life. God's love is faithful, a covenantal love. God's love never changes. Like David, taking delight in God's love will transform our, my Christian experience. As we meditate on God's love and all that it means, it will help us, it will enable us to do what Jesus commands in Mark chapter 8. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Verses 4 through 5. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hand. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. David's faith in God, remembering what God had already done, allows him to anticipate an answer to his prayer. God will respond. When we are weary, tired, afraid, or hurt, God is there to make us feel better. We should praise God because he is there for us. We satisfy ourselves with too little. Just listen to that. We satisfy ourselves with too little. We dull our hunger for God by turning to things which are not God. 
David knows that only God can satisfy him. His soul's hunger in the wilderness will be satisfied by a banquet beyond imagining. He knows that one day he will feast on God. And David won't let himself be satisfied with anything less. Therefore, David lifts up his hands in praise and worships God in the wilderness. Verse 6. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. It is nighttime in the wilderness. The darkness appears endless. It is hard to rest. Insomnia strikes. How will you survive until the morning? David has the answer. Meditate on the goodness of God, on how God has watched over you and protected you throughout your life. Even in your rough and uncertain times, God has sustained you and kept you alive and strong through them all. We need to be close to God throughout the whole day, no matter what, no matter where we go or what we do. He is always with us and is always willing to help us, no matter what. Verses 7 through 8. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. When we are close to God, our soul is healthy and full of life. Without God, our soul is weak. So we need to be as close to God as possible. When we strip away everything else in life, God is really all that we have. God is really all that we have. So what are you searching for? When we search for God, we must make a conscious choice to direct our heart towards God. When we truly seek to dwell in God's presence, to immerse ourselves in God's word, love, and grace, we cannot help but be changed. We trust that the Holy Spirit will show up, stirring us into a deeper faith and understanding. 2 Thessalonians 3.5, Paul prays, May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. So you heard us sing before the message. Amazing. And I think that's probably what David was feeling. But when I started looking at this and, and, and feeling how I was going to move through it and what God wanted me to do, there was a song that I've only sung once. I sung, sung it with an accompaniment. And so I'm going to do a little bit of that because this is the song also that I think David could have sung. Okay. I know some of you know it, so if you know it, sing along with me. Okay? Okay. Amen. Amen. I climbed up to the highest mountain, looked all around, couldn't find nobody. Went down into the deepest valley, looked all around down there, couldn't find nobody. No, no. I went across the deep blue sea, couldn't find one to compare to your grace, your love, your mercy. Nobody greater, nobody greater than you. Said I searched all over, couldn't find nobody. I searched high and low, still couldn't find nobody. Nobody greater, nobody greater, nobody greater than you. Nobody can heal like you can. Oh, most holy one, you are the great I am. Awesome in all your ways and mighty. He who carried out redemption's 
got it. I got it. Pray that you, if you don't have it, you'll find it. And when you see me in the times when it seems I've forgotten, remind me who has me, and therefore I got it. Amen. 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 Yes. Yes. So, amen. What are you searching for? Amen. Amen. So we come now to the time where we open the doors of the church and invite those who are perhaps the empty soul. The soul has never known anything about Jesus to come forward. Or perhaps you're the dry soul. You gave your life to Jesus, but you, it's just been a little, it's just been a little slow. It's just been a little hard. Thank you. 